that's as gorgeous as this. Whether people are going to show an evening after they've been working in the garden. Can everybody hear me? Just now. Okay, because I want to make sure that you'll, you can hear Nathaniel because he's the one who really counts. My granddaughter's just saying, hold it to your mouth. <laughs> if you haven't signed the League of Women Voters petition over there to promote the vote, um, please do if you're interested. What it'll do, it's a proposed constitutional amendment that will make voting more accessible and convenient, ensure that everybody's votes are secure and counted, and ensure that everyone's voice is heard. And, you know, what's wrong with that? It sounds wonderful. So, got a petition over there if you're interested. Please put your name down. Um, I've got a couple words to say about Nathaniel, Dr. Nathaniel Warmstein. He's got an impressive resume. When I first looked it up in Wikipedia, I thought, I can't even talk to this man. <laughs> he's, he's got so much going. But he received, I'll tell you a little bit about him. He received a BA in Mathematics and Religious Studies from Grinnell College, a PhD in Computer Science from Carnegie Mellon University. Previously, he attended Ohio State University. And while he was at Carnegie okay. <laughs> Who did that? Tom, control yourself. <laughs> Don't get me started. While he was at Carnegie Mellon, he co-developed the email component of the Andrew Project. And I have to read this stuff because I have no idea what I'm talking about here. But the Andrew message system was the first multimedia electronic mail system to become used outside of a laboratory. In 1989, he became a member of the technical staff of Bellcore, which is Bell Communications Research. There he developed a series of standards so the various electronic mail systems could exchange multimedia messages in a common way. He's responsible for sending the first email attachment on March 11, 1992. And when somebody asked him why he wanted to do this, and this gives you a measure of the man, he said because at some point he was going to have grandchildren and he wanted to see their pictures. Is that do you get many odds like that? <laughs> Thank you. But he was founder of the first virtual holdings in 1994, called the first cyber bank by the Smithsonian Institute, and the netpos.com in 2000, 2000. He worked at IBM as distinguished engineer starting in 2002 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He then became chief scientist at email management company Mimecast in June 2010. He's author of Programming as if People Matter, Friendly Programs, Software Engineering, and Other Noble Delusions by Princeton University Press. He received the New York University Olive Branch Award for writing about peace, so he has many interests. And he wrote an essay about his brief experience with NATO. He lives with his wife, Trina, in Ann Arbor and in Harrisville. They have four grown daughters and three grands, so the pictures work. But he's on call all the time. We've had to cancel this a couple times because he gets a call from London or from Boston and he has to go. Um, and he was, when we called this third time to try and arrange it and set it up, everything was fine. He got a call and ended up in Boston for two weeks and he was coming home today. And when I, I think I uttered some kind of primal scream. <laughs> and he changed his flight to yesterday. So he came in last night and then drove up from Detroit. But we are so glad to see you. Yeah. <laughs> and appreciate your making arrangements and adjustments. But and beyond that, he's a wonderful guy. He's um, comfortable and <laughs> incredibly bright. I think you've got that. But um, he's nice, he's easy, he's generous. Um, so let's give a, well, and we're lucky to have both of them in our community. So give a warm welcome, please, to Dr. Daniel Warren. I've gotten nice introductions before, but I, I really felt quite so uh, so blushy. <laughs> I, I, I want to add one little thing before I get into the talk. This is a sort of, I like to talk about this as a sort of measure of the limited nature of being um, uh, a, a, a prophet, if you will, about technology. Back in the 1980s, I talked about multimedia mail because I wanted to get pictures of my grandchildren, my email. And by the way, that wasn't really the driving thing for me, but people sort of understood it. It was the easiest way to get people to understand. Anyway, in uh, 2010, I got the first picture of my grandchildren through email. Sort of like the culmination of the life's work, right? But what I didn't really expect, I thought they'd be cute, okay? <laughs> I thought they'd be cute, but what they were was 
two little dots, my twin granddaughters, two little dots in the ultrasound, they were like six weeks old, or no less than that, they were a few days old. And that bit of technology had no clue was coming. So, so you know, you, even people who can see ahead see sort of, sort of through a, a very narrow path based on, on what they uh, what they studied. Okay, so I'm going to talk um, mostly about net neutrality, but I'm going to talk a bit about Facebook since it's been so much in the news. And uh, I can't help talking then about the balance of power between citizens and corporations. Although I'm going to try not to be a radical leftist as I do it. It's not easy, but why not? Um, because I thought there might be a range of people in the audience, and net neutrality is really not a left right issue. Um, so I don't want to chase anyone away if there's anyone to chase away. Okay, so I'm going to start actually with a very brief history of the internet because that sets the stage for why, for what neutri net neutrality is and, and understanding how the absence of it changes things. Then I'm going to talk a bit about uh, uh, Facebook, how it, how it uh, got into the position it is that makes us all worried these days. Then a little bit about what the future holds and what you can do. So, a brief history of the internet, very brief. Well, actually we'll go back before the internet to the telephone networks. And many of you probably know this, but the telephone network is based on central offices. So all around your neighborhood or your community, there are um, lines going from houses to this central office. That's the basic architecture. It's very simple. And then there's what's called trunk lines connecting the various central offices. It actually works quite well most of the time. But the DOD was worried about what would happen um, in this kind of communication architecture. Um, with one little nuclear weapon, you could make a whole lot of trouble. Um, in terms of communication, because this is based on, on too much centralization. So now you've not only wiped out the town with that central office, you've isolated these other two. And the military doesn't really care about our phones, okay, but it was trying to build a survivable communication set system for, um, for the military. So back in the late 1960s, they started trying to figure out how to do this. And the concept that they came up with was a highly interconnected mesh or web of, uh, of machines with uh, dynamic routing. So that if you were trying to communicate from this machine to this machine, actually to that machine, you would normally go through here, but if this machine went down, you could go around like that. And that's the way the internet works. Um, you can take out almost any node, and almost everybody can still talk to each other. It's, it's quite normal. And this is actually a picture of the first internet, um, 1969. Uh, it's napkin drawing or something. Um, it looks like there's eight things here, but there's really four computers, and there's four what are called imps. The, the, the circles are imps. Those are special purpose computers for talking on the internet, because the basic computers weren't powerful enough to talk on the internet and do anything else. So nowadays the function of the imp is built into the computer. This is the four machine internet, and it doesn't quite achieve the vision. If you look at number four Utah up there, it's only got one connection, so it could be isolated relatively easily, but the others you see have, have two between them. So this is the, the first actual inkling of a survivable network. So time went on, and 11 years later, there were over 100 machines on the net, which was really cool. And as you can see, nearly everything here has two connections going in, in and out of it. We went to London in the corner as well. But so right here, if Utah tries to reach OWC, whatever that is, but this one is down, it can go really cumbersome route around and, and get to it. So uh, um, this was actually beginning to show uh, the, the concept of survivability in practice. And at this point, by the way, these are all either research labs, universities, or military sites. That's all I was allowed in there. And I happen to have this net because this is October 1980, is one month after I got involved. Um, so that's what I was. <laughs> um, and that is what I look for. Um, I was a part of the So. To be survivable, you had to have um, intelligence, if you will, at each node, because um, you had to make these routing decisions dynamically. That node's not answering, so I'm going to go around that way. Um, and that meant that each node could be independently administered and uh, owned and operated. So those of us who kind of could do essentially whatever we wanted to our computers, um, but if we wanted to talk to other computers, we had to agree with them about the format of messages and things that we sent around. So shared standards were needed to do anything interesting. But um, this was a research community. This was not a bunch of um, corporations looking for uh, advantage. 
And so it was very natural for people to just get everybody together in a room and hash out a mutually accepted way to do things. It was extremely open and extremely civilized. Um, and the result of that is that no one, no one company or anyone owns email or the web or any other service uh, that was uh, built before 1994. Um, email, you know, we own our email servers, you own your email servers, and, and it works because we agreed how to talk to each other, but there's no corporation that can say, we're going to do this to email, or we're going to tax email, or anything like that. So that was the golden age, for those of us who were there. Um, and it ended, it was based on cooperation, trust, and excitement of the new, because this stuff was just so cool and exciting. Um, but in 1993, the U.S. government announced that uh, you could use the internet for commercial things. Until then, you couldn't so much as, well, in theory, you couldn't so much as uh, sell a dinner over the internet. You were not allowed to conduct commerce. A few things happened, even um, as And that changed things a little bit. Um, you can probably guess how much we do over here. But from, and so it's, it, that was a wonderful thing from the standpoint of anybody who wants to buy stuff on Amazon or use any of the other services we take for granted. From a standpoint of openness, of cooperation between sites, and of letting anyone have input into these processes by which communication happens, it was an absolute disaster. And in fact, cooperation didn't pay. Um, companies wanted to own a service, not to play nicely with other rivals that were doing a similar service. And the result of that is all around us. And it, and it stark divide by 1994, almost anything developed since then, doesn't work that way. So, you know, go to a meeting, you want to talk to someone who's using Skype, it doesn't work that way. You have to both get on the same one. It doesn't have to work that way. There's no reason it has to work that way, except that each of these are trying to dominate the world. Similarly, Google Plus and Facebook can't cooperate, except in limited terms that they decide to their advantage. Um, none of the instant messaging apps work together. And this is particularly important because you have text messaging on your, on your phone. And there's no reason that shouldn't be able to communicate with your, your messaging apps on your computer, except that nobody agreed on how to do it. Um, music and video services tend to be mutually hostile. Um, you, can, uh, you can get the situation where you need to subscribe to several of them if you want to be able to get all the music you want, whereas in an open architecture, you could talk to all of them and bring them on in as you need them. So it, 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 this does not benefit consumers. Um, and no major new open services have succeeded since the web was the start line. We'll talk more about this when we get to Facebook, which you uh, may know was after 1994. Okay, so net neutrality, that's the back. What is net neutrality? Net neutrality is the principle, I'll read this so we all take time to get it, the principle that internet service providers, which we call ISPs, should enable access to all content and applications, which really means all um, people in the companies, without favoring or blocking any particular products or websites. Um, if you're familiar with how the telephone evolves at all, this, this is the idea that it's a common carrier. Your telephones had to be equally open to all, um, and they had to interchange with all the other systems. That was the price they paid for being allowed a monopoly by the government back in the beginning of the 20th century. This is sort of the, uh, the digital equivalent of treating everybody equal. Uh, so more simply, treating everybody equal. So this, among other things, gives new players a better chance. So I'm not saying it would be easy to compete with Netflix, um, but it would be much easier to compete with Netflix if Netflix couldn't collude with your ISPs to keep you out or to handicap you, which in the absence of net neutrality, they can do. Um, and that, in turn, tends to give consumers more viable choices. The more players there are in a service, the faster they tend to get um, new features that are useful um, because they're sort of in a competition over features rather than a competition over uh, dominating by denying access to the other guys. Okay. And it, it basically, net neutrality, puts limits on ISPs and monopolists. So why would anyone be opposed to this? This sounds very American. It is very American. Well, first reason is um, the companies that, uh, that have pursued monopolistic services, um, the ones that just Facebook, things like that, um, know they will make vastly more money if they can totally dominate the thing. So it is not in their interest um, to let everybody else play nicely with them. Uh, 
power is related to greed, but it's not quite the same thing because um, political power can get involved. Um, you can imagine a situation in which an ISP is owned by someone who has a political agenda. Think of the ISP equivalent of Fox News or maybe MSNBC. And they might therefore, not for money, but for other reasons, try to handicap um, anything that brought the opposition's message to them. And short-sightedness. Um, what's most remarkable to me, really, about the change from before and after 1994 was that before 1994, people were looking way into the future, trying to build something, you know, 21st century that, uh, that hadn't existed before. And after 1994, it was, how can we make millions of dollars by, by next year? That was, it, was, it was very short term. And this was just, net neutrality just gets in the way of that. Um, the other reason, the next reason? Oh, great, yes, because there's, there's, there's still lots of greed. That really is the dominant reason here. And uh, finally, um, Billy mentioned that. That's the dominant reason. Okay. So when you end up in you make things a lot worse. Um, you make a potential, you create a potential for alliances to shut out competition. And these aren't even alliances of similar entities like a duopoly. Um, these are uh, sort of covering the whole ecosystem. So this is, uh, this is where Netflix and uh, Charter Communication could conspire to handicap Amazon Video. Now, that's a completely reasonable thing without that. Well, completely legal thing without that neutrality. Okay. So yeah, so Charter Com I, I said it backwards from my slides. Charter Communications could do the following things without that neutrality. They can make a deal with Amazon that said Amazon gets faster service than any other video service. And they could uh, slow down Netflix traveling or put a surcharge on Netflix if they want faster traffic. Um, or they can take every Netflix thing that comes along and shrink the size a little bit and put a, a, an advertisement at the top of the money for which goes to charter, not Netflix. Uh, nothing to prevent them. Okay. And the worst thing is I might not get to watch Black Mirror. That, that's that, 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 that would be. Okay. So um, Charter can also introduce a bandwidth cap. There are, there, this is going on all the time right now with satellite like um, where you're only allowed a certain amount of bandwidth every month, but Amazon Video doesn't count. Okay, that gives it a slight advantage over Netflix, right? Because you know you'll have to pay more if you use Netflix. So that's your first choice where to go. Um, and eventually in this scenario, what's most likely to happen is that Netflix will give in and pay a huge surcharge to Charter to end its alliance with Amazon. Um, so from, a, from an ISP perspective, this is just a great way to do extortion. Um, and the worst thing is, none of these are theoretical. Um, not specifically these companies, but all of these things have been done. Okay? It actually happens, and um, when the net, net neutrality regulations were passed, um, I won't say it completely ended, but a lot less of this was happening. So we can look forward to more of that. Okay, so let, let's talk a little bit about the politics of net neutrality. Who is for it? Well, almost every internet company is for it. Um, almost every consumer um, or, or, or libertarian, really, um, or an organization that's concerned about um, free and universal access to information, they're all for net neutrality. So these consumer reports, ACLU, American Library Association, they're all on record very strongly supporting net neutrality. So who's, oh, not, not just liberals. I want to stress that in case there's anybody here who isn't a liberal. Um, Antonin Scalia, who is no liberal, um, was a strong supporter of net neutrality um, as a matter of basic fundamental principle and fairness. So who's against it? Well, I wish I, that was a nicer way to say this, but it's basically ISPs who are going to make money and ideologues who, for the most part, are going to make money. Uh, I mentioned greed, right? Did I remember? Did I remember? <laughs> um, so you've got Comcast and Verizon and those guys, and you've got nowadays at least the Republican Party and Brain Bart people like that. Now, why do they dislike it so much? Well, there's really two reasons. One is um, the Republicans, for example, have started getting huge contributions from the ISPs, which are big enough to make a difference in that stuff now. So you, know, you give me hundreds of thousands of dollars, and yeah, I'm against net neutrality. Unfortunately, there are Democrats that do that too, but it's, it's more predominant here. Um, what's really interesting, though, is that not so many years ago, 83% of conservatives and Republicans were for net neutrality. 
And that ended when Obama pushed through net neutrality. And all of a sudden, it became a bad thing. That, that to me, is sort of everything that's worse wrong with our politics. So, um, this is perhaps my favorite sentence of the 21st century so far. Um, when he was explaining his opposition to net neutrality, Ted Cruz said, net neutrality is Obamacare for the internet. And I tried really hard to make sense of this. Um, it's, yeah, it, I mean, it's a policy about equal access to subsidized health care for a technology. You know, but, so I came up with my own statement that I think is equally true, which is that right to life is Medicaid for all of <laughs> um, So frankly, you have to be profoundly uninformed um, to take statements like Ted Cruz's seriously. Having said that, lots of people are taking it seriously. Um, and that's exactly what the ISP is for. Okay, let's move on to Facebook a little bit. These topics are related, actually. And you might hope, when I say Facebook's fatal flaw, that I'm about to tell you the reason why Facebook is doomed or something like that. No, it's, it's, what, it's, it's the deep-seated reason why Facebook is horrible for the rest of us. That's, that's what I mean by fatal flaw. Okay, anybody here use Facebook? Okay, my name's Nathaniel, and I'm a Facebook addict. It's been 13 months since I last used Facebook. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, so I, I'm going to fake it until I make it. Um, so yeah, they obviously dominate the world. And I, the only reason I get away with not looking at Facebook is that I count on, uh, on Trina, my wife, and Alan to occasionally tell me there's something that we all want to see. So I'm still sort of on Facebook. Uh, what's important to know, when you think about these privacy breaches that you've all been hearing about, everybody's been hearing about those, right? Yeah. What's important to know is it's not an accident. They are not incompetent. They didn't like screw up. This is what it's supposed to do. What it's supposed to do is make it possible to use data about you in ways that make Facebook money. And they just made, if they made a mistake, it was maybe that they didn't look carefully enough and figure out that they were dealing with, you know, um, an organ of the Russian government or something like that. That there might be political consequences. But other than that, the system was working perfectly. So their privacy problems are deeply embedded in their business model because they are data brokers, and you are data. And so their job is um, selling information about you. If they treated you right, if they treated you the way you think you should be treated with regard to your information, maybe they wouldn't go broke, but, but they make a whole lot less money. Okay, so now they're in, in this um, weird state of trying to plug the most egregious abuses without killing abuse to lazy little legs. Um, and uh, they'll probably succeed. Um, I do think that Mark Zuckerberg and the other folks at Facebook are sincere about wanting to fix the worst things here. They don't want Facebook to destroy democracy. Okay, that was never their intent. That was a box of oops. Um, but on the other hand, while they're trying to fix it, they also have shareholders. And they have a, a duty to maximize return to shareholders. And the truth is, maximizing return to shareholders probably means destroying democracy. So they're, they're in a tough spot. I don't know. Now, to give you an idea of how this is related to the stuff I was talking about before, I'm going to compare and contrast two internet systems and how they're built architecture. So this gives you some idea of the architecture of email. You can see that your machine, center client, sends some mail to a mail server, which relays it, send it to another mail server, and there's the, the network is you know, very ad hoc and uh, lots of errors pointing out which way. And this is a teeny piece of it. If you multiply this by about a billion, you'll have the email architecture for the internet. This is the architecture for Facebook. Okay? Everybody talks to Facebook. And the only thing you multiply by a billion here is the number of women that's going on there. So if you like order, it's very neat. But what it means is that Facebook has complete control. Well, what's wrong with that? We have monopolies in other places. Why shouldn't we have them here? Well, first of all, everything that's wrong with any monopoly is wrong with an internet model. Higher prices, unfair competition, poor service. Just, just, just like you see when uh, when you decide it's time to break up, uh, I don't know, AT and T for the time. Um, but it's also worse than that because internet monopolies are created by companies that, as I said, have centralized systems. And the centralized system means that they are developed by a process that is not as good as the process that went into the earlier systems. So. Email was developed 
with a whole bunch of people negotiating and arguing and brainstorming about the best way to do things. Facebook, they had a few engineers in the room and said, what's the best way to do this to make a lot of money? Okay. So um, what I'm best known for, the MIME work, the MIME standard, people sometimes think that's a technical achievement. And it wasn't. I had some technical achievements before that. But MIME, as a standard, was a political achievement. I got over a hundred opinionated email geeks to agree to do things the same way. It was more about communication than technology. And you don't have to mess with that with these monopolies, which also means they are almost always faster to deploy because somebody just makes the decision. It doesn't matter if they're right or wrong, really, because nobody gets to argue. Um, so yeah, the world worked together to design email and the web, um, and, and as a result, not only do they work together, but they can still be extended in creative and open ways. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. Yeah, my team just did that recently for uh, multilingual mail. Um, and we worked for three years, and as of last fall, there's a new extension to the mail standards uh, for what we call multilingual email. And the basic idea here is just that I can send out a message in 10 languages, and you will see it only in your preferred language. Not as big an accomplishment as the original mind stuff, but it's useful. Doing something like that to Facebook is only possible for the people at Facebook. So if they don't see the value of it, it'll never get done. And I can tell you, I personally think this is a valuable thing. Um, as with a lot of stuff, most people won't see the value until they see it working. So it may never get off the ground in a place like Facebook. Um, so yeah, it's also the case that future systems will absolutely be poor if people around the world can't examine them, see exactly how they work, how they work, make suggestions on how to plug problems. Um, and that is, of course, as I said, the way everything new since 1994 works. You can't do And I want to stress that it doesn't have to be like this. It's not like social media inherently has to be centralized. In fact, it would be better if it were distributed. You can set it up so that you chose your social media server to talk to, maybe it's Facebook, maybe it's something else, and you might choose in part based on their privacy policies. You know, you want to make something available to everyone, you don't care so much, if you're really concerned about that, you choose the social media um, provider that is most concerned with privacy. And maybe they charge you, maybe they're not free, because they have to make their money, right? But you get to choose, would I rather have my data sloshed all around the internet, or would I rather pay a couple bucks a month? Facebook does not give, they could give you that choice, but they don't. Um, you would have more control over um, advertising, when and where it appeared, what type. Um, innovation, as I said, would be faster. And you'd have, um, sort of on the entrepreneur side, you'd have a whole lot of people making small fortunes instead of one person, like Mark Zuckerberg for Facebook, making a ridiculous, huge fortune. Um, there is no Zuckerberg in email or a Zuckerberg. In fact, I did some calculations based on questions about this. Somebody, every now and then somebody asked me if I make royalties on mine. No, you don't make royalties on a standard, but if I got a penny every time mine was used, my annual income would be the GDP of Germany. Yeah. Okay, so guess what? <laughs> We're all better off not having to be that rich. Um, and it's also important to note that this change was triggered entirely by government policies or their absence. You know, the thing that triggered the change was the U.S. government saying, it's open for commerce, do whatever you want. They could have also said, but here's some rules you have to follow. And in particular, they could have had rules around <coughs> open protocols and making sure that um, different components of the system could communicate in ways that could be seen, understood, and dealt with by more than one company. Um, so, yeah, 